Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Welcome to the 2021 preamp shootout. And this ended up being a lot bigger ordeal than I originally anticipated. First I was going to build a copy of the little Zero Zone Conrad Johnson clone amplifier using a board instead of buying their pre-built one and using some of their same components but some upgraded stuff and just build a little preamp. Then a viewer sent me this preamp and I was like cool we'll do a little shootout. Then he sent me another one this little Morant 7 clone and then I got to thinking how is the best way to test these things? I don't have an amplifier that really needs a preamp. So then we built this little EL84 spud amp that doesn't have a driver section that needs a pretty strong input signal to drive it to full power to test these with. And I worked out how to equalize the settings for all the different gains on the audio analyzer 2 and I really think that we've got a great shootout here and I'm going to say now there isn't a clear winner. There's two very different amps that are both good but there is a clear loser and we'll cover that at the wrap up at the end of this video but let's get into the testing and looking at the internals of these things and how they're built. Okay, we're going to dive into the inside of the little Morant 7, which I feel has the crappiest build quality and cheapest looking components of the three that I've tested. And we're going to zoom in to problem number one right there. 110 volt transformer. So, we powered this thing up. It's got 7.1 volts on the heaters. This thing's going to just eat tubes unless you run it on 110 volts, which I did for the rest of the testing because I didn't want to have the tubes blow up on me. And there's nothing mentioned and anything that comes with it, actually there's no paperwork other than where to put the tubes in it. The next thing to note is right here. Hey, what's our safety ground hooked up to? Absolutely nothing. So, if this amp ever has any kind of a electrical failure, like the power transformer shorts out, or some one of these solder joints come undone and something touches this metal chassis and it becomes live with 250 volts, there's nothing to protect you. So this thing, it's not even close to being electrically safe or, you know, UL listed is it being a, is just a joke on this thing. The next thing to note is these little super cheap plastic RCA connectors. One of them actually fell apart when I pulled the cable out of it the first time I plugged it in. The other thing they've done is they've run both the left and the right signal through the same cable. So you've got the left and right positive wire laying next to each other all the way around over to the input selector. So obviously that's going to introduce crosstalk between the two channels. The layout, they've got this is the star ground right here, this right there, that's their little star ground point. And then they run the ground underneath these caps down here and have everything all connected up there. And they've got the RCA jacks grounded through a resistor and this little capacitor that's to the chassis, but the chassis itself isn't grounded. 
And so I'm not sure exactly what their goal there is. So anyway, let's flip this thing around. I don't want to spend too much time on any one of these. When we look at this side, we've got a little PC board that's our selectors. We got a really cheap audio potentiometer for the input. We got our on-off switch with just a giant cheap toggle switch. And they're using a PC board for the power supply. And that's basically the internal construction on this one. Again, this seems to be the cheapest built of the three. The only thing that makes it look even slightly upscale is the little, the, the little wood ends they put on it. But, you know, that could easily be some vinyl-wrapped plastic board, and that's kind of what it looks like. So, let's get on the next one and look at the inside of it. Okay, here's candidate number two, and it was the cheapest of the three preamps that were put into the shootout, and it's actually pretty well made. It's got a really pretty wooden chassis with a metal plate. If we look over here, they actually have the safety ground connected up to the IEC connector. It goes straight to this metal plate. So this one does have the safety ground connected, which is a definitely a bonus. The other thing is the main ground points of the amplifier are connected through these studs to the chassis which gives it a ground between the circuitry and the top plate so that if there's any kind of malfunction, parts short out, transformer short out, that it will blow the fuse and not electrocute you, which is a little bonus to have here. It's got a, another fairly cheap looking little potentiometer, but these things seem to work. I mean, I'm not going to deduct too many points for that for not having some, you know, audio note $50 potentiometer on a $150 product. It's got nice big reservoir caps, which you can tell that there's a lot of reserve in the power supply. Here are little coupling caps. They don't look like the highest quality. Uh, that's probably something that we can upgrade in this little lamp. The transformer is labeled as 120V, and when I checked the voltages at the heaters, it's 6.4 volts. And so it's actually got 120 volt wired transformer, which is another bonus. It's got much nicer RCA jacks than the other one. They're not the super nice ones, but they're nice enough. They do the same thing, though, where they combine the left and the right signal in the same cable, which I'm not a big fan of, but probably not the end of the world. And overall, this is a well-made little unit. It's got uh, a nice push-on, push-off switch with a illumination. It's got kind of bright green. I would probably put a resistor in that wire to tone down the brightness of it. But overall, this is a nice made amp. The only thing that I think that they probably failed on is they attempted to use AC heaters on a circuit board type amplifier. Might have been able to get away with it on point to point, but with a circuit board, the traces, there's no way to twist the wires per se. And so this amp does have a little bit of hum in it which we could probably fix. There's enough room over here on the side here, over here, over here, to put a little circuit board that would convert these AC to DC heaters and then run them over here to the heater inputs. And depending on what the customer, if he wants me to do that, I may do that for him to, to clean up the hum, which is really the only issue that I have with this amp. So... Let's go look at the last one.
And this is the last one that's in our shootout. And this is the little zero zone board one that I built from parts that I bought here in the U.S. So it's definitely got higher quality parts than the other two amps. It's got a Alps volume control. It's got these super nice RCA jacks. This is a 15 volt transformer. All the voltages came out right where they were supposed to be. One thing a viewer commented on, and I hadn't really checked out, but I don't doubt this is the case, it uses 6-volt regulators for the DC heaters. And there's only 7 volts DC going into them. And these regulators require 8 volts DC to operate correctly. So while there's between 6.4 and 6.5 volts at the heaters that really should be six volts because of these regulators and so they're possibly cycling between turning on and off and possibly doing something weird with the heater voltages but I don't hear any hum and so I'm not sure that that's really an issue it's got a clean layout the chassis is grounded including the circuit board, the transformer, and then we have a solid safety ground over here that's separate from the signal ground path. And grounding this ground plane of the board to the chassis, there's no hum, don't have any hum loops or anything, so everything's safely grounded. If anything ever happens, the chassis is never going to get hot without blowing a fuse. It's got a Nice little push-on, push-off switch with a LED backlighting, which looks nice. And I did find that while it's spec to use 12 AX7 tubes, it had some weird issues running 12 AX7 tubes. And it ran perfect and sounded better with 12 AU7s and still puts out a lot of gain. And so... Possibly using these lower gain tubes is what gave it such low distortion numbers. And it's still putting out way over twice what that Marant 7 was. So I think it turned out nice. Obviously, I'm going to brag on myself on the layout, how I ran separate channel wires over here and kept everything away from the AC noise. And unlike the 6SN7 amp, this one has zero hum, zero noise, and 0, 0.0 something distortion levels. And so this turned out to be a super clean sounding preamp, and it does what it says it's supposed to do. So that's the inside of this last one, and I'm proud of how this turned out. You can see the construction of this in the build series video that I'll link in the description. So the first amp up for test here is the little 6S and 7 simple amp, which, like I just stated, was the simplest design of the three that we're testing today. And let's see what kind of performance we get out of it. These first two tests were done with the output of the preamp connected directly to the Analog Discovery 2. And I set the input voltage here so that we got the same output voltage here for all three preamps. And I felt that was the best way to kind of normalize three different gain amps to give them an equal footing on their performance. So we can see this one is about a half a percent of distortion flat across the whole frequency range. And if we look at the spectrum chart down on the lower left as I'm scrolling across, it stays fairly consistent across all the frequencies. Then the next test we did on just the preamp was the frequency response. And it rolls off just a tiny bit under 20 hertz, which is meaningless. You can see the rest of it says basically a totally flat fr frequency response curve, which is what we want to see out of a preamp. The last test we were going to do 
is this is a THD versus power going into the EL84 spud amp we built to see how well the preamp drives an amplifier that needs a preamp. And so let's go ahead and start the test. And this is pretty much what I was expecting to see. This amp went, goes into hard clipping at three and a half watts and we see it turn up here. And even right before the clipping, we've got 5% distortion. But down here where we're probably gonna be listening to this amp, you know, this would be at loud volume levels with efficient speakers. We're at 3% and we're just under 2% at one watt. But look how low the input signal needs to be to make one watt of power out of this amp. We only need 0.355 volts to have one watt out. And then at three watts, we need 0.634 volts. And that's something we'll be comparing at the end of this shootout. So let's hook up another amp and see how it tests. So here's the second preamp in the shootout. This is the little Conrad Johnson amp that I built. And it calls for using 12 AX7 tubes, but it sounds much, much better with 12 AU7s making a little less gain. But it still makes a lot more gain than the Marant 7 did and less than the 6SN7 did, just like the original video shootout with the scope pattern showed. So I found this one needs 1.4 volts in to come up with our 12 volts out. And the interesting thing to note here is we've got a lot less distortion, like a whole digit over. We've got less than 0.1% distortion across the whole range. But if you look at the spectrum graph on the lower left, in the lower frequencies, it seems fine. It's not as evenly distributed as far as the harmonics. But then when you get up around in this range, it starts doing this weird little wave thing right in that range right in there. Yeah, I've got no idea what's going on there. But I think most of that is below the level of being able to hear because its distortion is so low. So I just thought that was odd seeing how that little wave flows across the spectrum. But again, down in even this range, the harmonics just aren't as nice looking as they are on the 6SN7. But it's also at such a low level, you're probably not going to hear it. And when we look at the frequency response, it's, again, totally flat. So... Don't, not going to have a problem with the frequency response coloring the tone. But let's see what the THD versus power does on this preamp driving our EL84 spud amp. And here we go. Seeing a very similar. Now the interesting thing to me is we're actually seeing more distortion at one watt than we did with the 6SN7 preamp, even though it's got lower distortion on its output than the 6SN7 amp does. The other thing to note here is the input voltage for the same output needs to be higher, which is to be expected. And at two watts, we need 
0.7 volts RMS and at 3 watts we're right at 1 volt RMS which is still a reasonable expectation from a source to be able to get full power out of the amp. But again, just seems a little odd that we've got higher distortion on the output of the amp even though we have less distortion on the output of the preamp. And honestly guys, I don't know what's going on there, but numbers don't lie. So, time to throw the last preamp on here and see what we get. Okay, here's our last little preamp that's in this first shootout. And it's a clone of the Marantz 7, or that's what it's supposed to be. And this one, I ended up to get it to sound good, replacing all of the output tubes. It came with some PS Vein 12 AU7s and some PS Vein 12 AX7s. And I swapped in some Electro Harmonics 12 AU7s with some Gold Lion 12 AX7s. And that was the best combination of tubes that I had on hand to put in this amp. I tried four 12 AU7s. I tried you know, switching the 12 AX7s and the 12 AU7s and moving everything around. And this was the combination that sounded the best. And so, like on the other two amps, I'm doing these tests with the tubes that sonically sounded the best when I was doing my listening tests with all three of them. So as we look at this one, it's also got super low distortion. In this range, it's a little higher than the, the Conrad Johnson clone was, but it's still well below 0.1%. And once you get into the audible ranges, you know, from 40 hertz and up, it's, you know, below 0.05% distortion. And this one doesn't have that same wave on the spectrum that the Conrad Johnson had. And it seems to have more even harmonics. But the harmonics that we are getting are such a low percentage, you're not going to hear them. And so, for all intents and purposes, this and the Conrad Johnson are going to sound more like you would hear from a solid state preamp. Which, at their time, when these were designed, that was their goal, was to get a tube preamp with as low a distortion as they could possibly get. So if we go to our frequency response, again, super flat, and if you notice we're running this at 3 volts to get the same output we got out of the other two. So it's taking 3 volts RMS to get to the same 12 volts but it's a nice flat frequency response curve. And as you can see, we got our 12 volts here with 3 volts in. So let's do a THD versus power running through this EL84 spud amp and see how well this thing drives a hard-to-drive amplifier. And, as you can see here, once again, at 1 watt, we actually have higher output harmonic distortion than we did with the 6S and 7 amp that had more harmonic distortion coming out of the preamp. Which, I've told you all before, I'm not an electrical engineer. That's baffling to me, but numbers don't lie. Also, look at, it takes one volt RMS to make one watt. Takes 1.5 volts RMS to get to two watts. And it takes almost 
2 volts RMS to get to 3 watts. Now what I noticed while listening, and I'll talk about this a little more when we do the wrap up to this video, to get a reasonable listening volume out of this little spud amp hooked up to my Clips RP600Ms, this little preamp had to be turned wide open. So there was no headroom. It was all this preamp could do to drive this little spud amp where the 6S and 7 amp was easily able to drive it. Now, if you wanted to put this between a source and your integrated amplifier, this might be a good choice, but then I question, what are you even getting? Because this is not going to impart any tube sound into your signal path like most people would be buying a tube amp for because the total harmonic distortion coming out of this preamp is so low, it's not going to be audible. So I think that pretty much shows how all three of these amps perform, and I'm going to roll into the wrap-up of the video. So it's time to wrap this thing up and also discuss some of the subjective listening tests. And I tried these with the little EL84 spud amp, and I also tried it with my 6SQ7 EL34 amp with the volume control turned way down so that it could use the drive these were putting out. And this is what I'm saying that there's not a clear winner because we have two very different preamps here. This one here is super clean. It's got almost no distortion, doesn't color the signal at all. Basically, what goes in comes out amplified. And on a really good sounding tube amp that already has like kind of a zero feedback or minimal feedback, single ended triode or that type of amplifier, this might be good because you've already got a good sounding amp and you just need more gain, especially if you had some sort of a really weak input signal that you needed to boost up to put into your amp, this would be a good option if you're using the 12 AU7 tubes. I haven't dug into why the 12 AX7 tubes were acting so crazy. I'm not sure if the the MOSFET that I picked as a replacement for the one that was spec'd can't deal with the power that a 12AX7 is pulling but doesn't have any problem with the 12AU7. It sounds so good. I'm not sure I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. If some of you build this amp, the only downside that I see to this preamp is I don't think the power supply is the greatest thing in the world. The way the 6.3 volt heaters are done, I think you could probably do it cleaner just using some power resistors to drop the DC voltage down to 6.3 volts instead of trying to use a voltage regulator. And the same thing for the MOSFET. I'm not sure that that's really even needed or wanted. You could fudge a little bit on these plate voltages. And anyway, you know, that's some options for you guys that may have already built this or are planning to build this, that there's probably even more to be gained from playing around with the power supply on this. And that's where I would focus my attention, as well as maybe trying some fancier coupling caps. I use the Mundorf MKPs, and I think I put an orange drop on the input. And same thing with those other coupling caps. Maybe try some aluminum oil Mundorfs, but there's six or eight caps in this thing, and they're 15 bucks a piece. I just didn't really want to dump that much money into a preamp that I really don't personally have a use for. I was doing this mostly for the channel. So, anyway, that's where this one shines. If you are wanting to put some tube sound into your system, and that's the reason that you're putting 
one of these preamps between your source and maybe a solid state amplifier, this one fails. It's not going to introduce anything. And I feel like that most people that are looking at a tube preamp, they're looking for a little warmth or a little tube sound or some of the harmonics that you get from a tube amp. And this is not going to do it. You're going to be disappointed. It's going to sound exactly the same. And this one is the same way. It's got almost no harmonic distortion that's going to add anything to your sound. It's built cheap. It's got the wrong voltage transformer. It's, it's ugly. It's got these cheap looking tubes and this nasty looking switch. It doesn't even have a power indicator. It's got just total garbage RCA jacks. The chassis is not grounded, so it's not safe. Everything's running at the wrong voltages, and it doesn't even have enough gain for it to be worthy of being put in a system, and it's not going to add any tube sound either. So when I said there's a clear loser, this is the loser. And this was by far the most expensive amp in this whole series. The other thing that's a failure on this part is... They spent the money on tube rectifiers and then in these wobbly sockets with these cheap, hard-to-find China rectifi seven pin rectifier tubes and then they stick a MOSFET after it, which is going to negate any possible advantage to having tube rectification. So, th so these things are just lighting up on top of the amplifier for no good reason. Again, both of these are not going to color your sound. They're probably not why you're looking at getting a tube preamplifier. And this one is expensive. It's made cheap. It's not safe. And it's got probably a third of the gain of this one. So it's not even doing its job as a preamplifier of boosting up a weak signal. So Skunky gives this one an F for effing awful. Don't waste your money on one of these. And I see them all over the internet. You know, they're, I think Amazon even sells them. I think they're like $350. So do not waste your money on one of these. This guy is the surprise ringer in the group. When it first showed up, I thought, what is this piece of crap? It's got this funky wooden knob and it had three super cheap looking china uh, tubes in it this little chrome plated uh, power transformer that's like half the size of this one and it had a little piece of masking tape on top of it with somebody wrote in ink 120 v and then some chinese writing under it and i'm like going wow <laughs> what the hell is this but the more i looked at it the more i thought you know what? This little guy might be the bomb. And if you're looking to put a two preamp in your system for the reason that I believe most of you are, this guy's it. It's got a half a percent distortion, which isn't a lot. So it's not going to, you know, all sound crazy crappy like that A12 did with, or that A50 with 10% distortion, but it's got enough distortion that you're going to get some of that tube sound harmonics that I believe people are looking for when they're buying a tube preamp. It's also well made. It's got not nice jacks on it. This little wood case is nice. Even this kind of polished gold finish on the top looks nice. Now, you're looking at these tubes going, those don't look like cheap china tubes. These are not. And I did a lot of tube rolling. And while these tubes are expensive, these, they're CV181-Z. They're the Treasure Series tubes that have the black carbon coating on the inside. Guys, these sound lovely in this little preamp. When I hook this preamp up to that EL84 amp, I could hear the bass. I could hear just a nice 
warmth and feeling to the amp that I didn't get with this. So if you're building that EL84 Spud amp, planning on driving it with one of these preamps, this is absolutely the one you want to build. So where do we go forward from here? Well, I think I'm kind of finished working on this one in this direction. I don't think that this super clean, super low THD preamplifier is what most people are looking for in a tube amplifier. And this thing was probably designed in a transitional period between tubes and solid state where they were trying to really hit the low THD numbers with lots of negative feedback. I mean, there's no telling how much gains inside this thing that then gets buffered back with the negative feedback to get the THD this low out of tubes. So it's doing its job that it was designed for. But I think this is what people are looking for is this sound. And the only problem with this one is it does have some DC hum and they made the mistake of trying to run the heaters on these preamp tubes using AC with a circuit board. And I don't think you can get away with using AC in a preamp for the heaters unless you're using twisted pairs of point to point type wiring. And so the fix this, I think the solution is going to be trying to convert it to DC heaters, which I'm going to talk to the customer about and see if he wants me to go down that route, but I'm pretty sure he will. And I think with DC heaters, this thing's going to sound great. But what I want to do is clone this and build one in a little Hammond chassis with a, with a nice transformer, with a tube rectifier with no MOSFET. Let's get that sand out of this thing and then build it with either a single or with two 6S and 7s using one as a cathode follower. We may even try both paths. And like I said, I ordered the parts for the little 4S preamp, which is a single 12AU7 or AX7 or AT7. You can put any of those tubes in there and it doesn't have a cathode follower so I think I want to experiment with both with just the triode and then with a triode and a cathode follower and then maybe do a future shootout with uh, a 6S and 7 versus a 12AU7 and do the 8 pin 9 pin shootout think that may be something fun to do in the future but for now we've got other projects and I think we've settled this dispute here and while I said earlier I wasn't going to declare a pure winner I'm going to this one wins with these super nice tubes it also sounds good with like some Sylvanias or some other new old stock the China tubes sound horrible so don't even try it with the tubes it comes with and honestly, same with this amp. These PS vein tubes that, are, that this thing came with, they sound terrible. To actually sonically test this, and I did lots of tube rolling with all of these, and some electroharmonics with some Gold Lion 12AX7s sounded nice. But none of these PS vein tubes sounded good in any position, in any of these amps. And so... You know, if you're going to buy any of these, assume you're going to have to throw away all the tubes. So, anyway, that's our preamp shootout. And I think we kicked some butt here on testing these things. And I think we kind of got to the bottom of these, you know, what advantage these complicated circuits that have multiple tubes, what they bring to the table versus these very simple circuits. And I think what people are looking for in a tube preamp they're going to find in products like this. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the series. If you like the channel, please subscribe. Please like the video. And we'll see you in the distant future for more preamp fun. Have a great day.